Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Julius Tachi and Hannah Gibson. Julius is a senior lecturer in the Department of Foreign Languages and Linguistics at the University of Dar es Salaam and a research associate in the Department of Linguistics and Language Practice at the University of the Free State. His areas of interest include morphosyntactic structures of Bantu languages, lexicography, and sign language linguistics. Currently, he's engaged in a collaborative research project entitled Variation in Swahili, Contact Change and Identify, with scholars from the UK and Kenya. He's also engaged in a project titled Linguistic and Social Cultural Aspects of Plant Names in Jiao, funded by the American Council of Learned Societies. Hannah is a senior lecturer in linguistics at the University of Essex. Her research is concerned with linguistic variation, particularly why and how languages change. Much of her work explores the syntax and semantics of the Bantu languages with a focus on languages spoken in Eastern and Southern Africa. She's engaged in multiple projects. For example, she works as a co-investigator in the project Bringing the Inside Outside In, merging local languages and cultural, sorry, literacy practices to enhance classroom learning and achievement, and a project titled Dialectology in Bantu Languages, Variation in Bemba Across Phonology and Morphosyntax. Please join me in welcoming Julius and Hannah as they give their talk, Investigating Grammatical Variation in Swahili. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for the, the warm welcome and the very nice introduction. Um, and of course, thank you to the network for the introduction, um, the invitation to, to be here. Um, we're going to be talking about the project that Anna mentioned in the introduction. Um, so I'll just get started. Um, I'll be talking first and then I'll hand over um, to, to Julius. Um, so this will be familiar to, to many of you, but just to give you a bit of a background, um, so we're going to be talking about Swahili, uh, a Bantu language, and the Bantu language is a group of some 450 to 600 languages spoken across much of uh, Eastern, Central and Southern Africa. So there is a long history of work on the Bantu languages, but the last 20 years or so have really seen a significant advancement in our understanding of variation across the Bantu languages and within uh, individual languages, um, particularly in the domain of what we're thinking of here as, as morphosyntax. So kind of structural properties. Um, and there's a very long list, uh, and this is no means uh, exhaustive, but this includes work examining specific structures. So things like uh, double object constructions or object marking patterns more broadly, um, negation, uh, relative clauses, um, we could list lots. Um, but it also includes work that takes a more kind of regional um, approach or regional studies. So looking at patterns, for example, in some areas of Eastern Africa or the Great Lakes or Southern Africa. So kind of both looking at specific structures and then looking at broader uh, geographic uh, patterns. Um, the improved descriptive status of many Bantu languages has also made um, kind of comparative studies on morphosyntax and comparative studies more broadly more feasible in uh, recent years. So that's one sort of strand of our background, if you will. Um, and there is a parallel uh, point to our, our background as well here, which is parallel growth uh, can be seen in research examining morphosyntactic micro variation. So small scale differences between closely related languages or dialects. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a growing, again, a growing body of work that kind of adopts this approach. So this includes work that's adopted uh, formal approaches to variation, um, lots of which is uh, generative or generatively inspired. Um, we've got a reference here to Ginolo et al, um, but there's lots of work that's adopting sort of more, yeah, uh, theoretical approach to variation or micro variation. And then there are large scale, often comparative studies across regions or countries. So this kind of body of work tends to, and, and to date is very much focused on dialectal variation in European languages, um, but has also again started to draw on syntactic aspects of variation. And again, this list is not exhaustive, but what we're thinking of are things here, such as the Scots Syntax Atlas, the photo or the picture in the right hand corner here is, is from the, um, the Scott Syntax Atlas project. They have a very nice interactive map where you can go and look at features, listen to recordings and 
explore a little bit more about the variation they um, identified across Scots, for example. Uh, there's also projects like the Syntactic Atlas of the Dutch dialects, uh, Northern Italian dialects project, and and so on. And again, you know, there's a mu there's much more that could be could be said about the work in, in those um, languages as well. And then there are studies of dialectal variation in Welsh. Um, we're thinking of, of the work of Dave Willis here and colleagues, and Spanish, um, both um, across uh, Europe and parts of Central and Southern America. Um, and here we just have a reference to the work of Miriam Boisuita. Um, so we're thinking of these kind of pieces of work in a similar vein. So here thinking about micro variation, uh, but particularly thinking about syntactic or morphosyntactic micro variation. And here drawing primarily on uh, European languages um, or languages spoken um, in, in Europe. So what we'd like to do in this talk is uh, report on a new project in which we're uh, seeking to examine dialectal variation in Swahili with a focus on morphosyntax. So what we like to think we're doing is bringing together these two concurrent strands of research. So you have this growing body of work on the Bantu languages on the one hand, and then this growing body of work looking at dialect syntax on the other. And we're now doing that for Swahili. Um, it's in early stages, so we're really just going to tell you about the project, but particularly given this audience, we're really keen to hear your questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions, insights, um, that would be great. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the goals of the project, um, some of the methodological insights or challenges that we're perhaps uh, grappling with at the moment, and then we also want to ask a little bit how the study of a major African language, major African lingua franca, might broaden scholarship on language variation. So those references we had on the previous slide, um, notably they're not sort of um, projects of a large scale looking at African languages. So I present a little bit of a background. I'm going to then introduce you to the, the project. Uh, and then I'll hand over to Julius, who's going to talk a bit about some uh, what we mean when we talk about variation in Swahili. So we have some examples to share with you. And then a little bit, we'll talk about methodological considerations and then point out the summary and conclusions, which are really at this stage, next steps and what we're going to going to do. Um, so, yes, this will be familiar to this audience, but we want to just highlight the key points that we've got in mind here. So Swahili, major African language, regional lingua franca across lots of East Africa, as well as a first or primary language. Um, terminology here is a bit contested, but um, amongst uh, coastal communities and particularly traditionally sort of, or historically. There are numerous varieties or dialects that are attested and spoken by different communities. And this is actually already one of our methodological kind of um, challenges. So there are named varieties or dialects that people may have heard of. So Kimbite, Kinguja, Kiamu, and, and many more, um, which have been described. And in fact, there's a long history of work on, on those dialects. Moreover, Swahili is used in many instances in multilingual or highly multilingual contexts. Um, so it's in sustained contact with other languages, Bantu languages and non-Bantu languages. Despite this and despite its vast number of speakers, there is no in-depth examination of variation, present day variation in Swahili um, or of its role in the kind of linguistic, cultural and social identities of Swahili speaking communities <laughs> or its role as a global language, in fact. So all of that to say there's lots of work going on on Swahili and, and there's work on individual bits. But what we're trying to do, perhaps, is to bring together these multiple aspects into one kind of study. Um, a little bit more about the project. Um, so the project is, I think we said in the introduction, entitled Grammatical Variation Swahili, Contact, Change and Identity. And we're lucky that we have funding from the Leverhulme Trust, uh, which is a UK based um, funder um, who have agreed to fund uh, this highly collaborative research project. Just started at the end of last year, so September, and we have four years of funding um, at the moment. Crucially, it is a collaboration, so it's um, myself um, and Teresa Poeta, who are based at the University of Essex in, in the UK, um, uh, Frida Kanana, who's at Kenyatta University in Kenya, uh, Lutz Martin and Tom Jelka, who are at SOAS in London, and then, of course, my colleague Julius Taji, who's here um, from the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, so we have a, a team of co-investigators. Uh, Tom is a PhD student working on the project and Teresa is a postdoctoral research assistant. 
So what are we trying to do? We have three research questions that the project is structured around and which later you'll see inspire our methodology. We're interested in the present day morphosyntactic variation found in Swahili. So again, thinking more here about kind of structural syntactic, morphosyntactic features. We're interested in the role that language contact plays in the variation attested. So if you think about the point we had on the previous slide, Swahili in many cases um, spoken in multilingual areas in contact with Bantu and non-Bantu languages. We're interested in how language contact then maps onto or influences the variation attested. Can we say that variation that's found in one area is the result of contact? And if so, what does that look like? Contact with which languages, which features, and so on. And then the third question we have, which is a strand running throughout the project, is what is the relationship between this structural variation, this morphosyntactic variation, and the role the language plays for the construction and negotiation of speaker's identity. So we're then interested in not only the, the examples of variation, but then how this maps onto speaker identity, how people use uh, Swahili, how people use varieties and variation within Swahili to either indicate, indicate identity or negotiate or, or form um, identity. And of course, to what extent people are perhaps able to perceive that um, in other users as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So for each of our questions, we have sort of associated methods that we're aiming to use. So to look at the dialectal variation um, in, in Swahili, um, we're starting with an initial perceptual dialectology study. Um, and actually this builds on some of Tom's work that he did as part of his MA, where you can work with speakers and ask questions such as, you know, are there areas where people speak differently from you? You know, what, what features do you recognize um, or that characterize those areas? You can get people to draw maps for you. You can show maps and get people to indicate things on that. So just to sort of to better understand people's initial um, perceptions, um, you could also, you know, play recordings and so on. We're also, as part of that strand, um, developing what we're calling at the moment a Swahili dialect syntax uh, survey. Um, so we're going to develop a set of uh, features which we'll look at um, for, the, for the dialects or for the variation to see how the, how the variation is different in different places. Um, and for that, we'll use kind of um, a combination of elicitation, so perhaps more um, familiar for those you know, who work in sort of syntax, a kind of tried and tested um, method. However, um, not without its, its faults and its challenges. So we're also, of course, um, aiming to collect naturally occurring speech. For the um, examination of the role of language contact, this is more kind of qualitative analysis. So better understanding the language ecologies where Swahili is spoken, what are the contact languages? What's the different relations between the contact languages? What features do the languages have? And of course, there to understand better the sociolinguistic dynamics and actual levels or perceptions of multilingualism. So for myself, as someone who's interested in language contact, I feel that language contact is often a uh, last case resort. So we can't explain this feature. Oh, let's say it's a result of language contact or you know, another language is spoken in this area. But we know that things are more complicated than that. And so to better understand this, we really want to actually understand the dynamics um, and also um, sort of power relations and, and levels of multilingualism. Um, and so that's linked to our third question, some of the methods we'll use there. Um, for the more kind of sociolinguistic aspects, we'll use again uh, methods from sociolinguistic inquiry, so language use and attitude uh, questionnaires. Um, so can distribute questionnaires to people to try and understand how they use language, how they perceive of language uh, or different languages, and of course, more in-depth interviews as well. So with a smaller group of people um, trying to better understand their linguistic repertoires, where and when they use certain languages and what their attitudes might be towards those. So just, I think, my final slide, and then I'm going to hand over to, to Julius. Um, we have six areas of focus that we identified um, in, the, in the project proposal um, when we were sort of devising um, the project. And we've chosen six areas that aim to incorporate coastal and mainland locations, urban and rural locations, and then those areas which are at least traditionally uh, monolingual areas or sort of traditionally um, Swahili uh, dominant um, areas, as well as those areas 
which are perhaps more multilingual and where Swahili has been in sustained contact with other languages, um, both Bantu and non-Bantu languages. So it's, it's quite a challenge to do that in six locations. And actually, um, you know, when I introduced the team, I should have also said that we're going to appoint two uh, research assistants at the University of Dar es Salaam and two research assistants at Kenyatta University as well. So we will have a slightly larger team and you know, depending on their interests or links and connections, it would be great to work in other areas um, as well. So we're very happy to be driven by people's interests and pre-established connections. But this is what our sort of starting point was. So the idea here is that we have coastal areas in Lamu and Zanzibar, and then we have more kind of mainland uh, locations in the other four places. Urban and rural is perhaps a little bit more complicated. Um, and we're also kind of conscious of notions of urbanity uh, um, rurality and how these change in different places. So it may well be that we think of, uh, for example, Moshi as a uh, urban area, but you can get to Moshi rural like relatively easy as easily as well. So thinking about what that really means and that it's not entirely straightforward. But we might think of um, you know Nairobi or the centre of Kusumu as you know urban centres at least. And again, in terms of contact, for example, we'd have a ringer where. No, we're expecting contact with other Bantu languages, um, and I know it's it's more complex than, than this, but uh, contact with other Bantu languages, um, whereas, for example, in Moshi, we would expect contact um, with uh, non-Bantu languages as well, and the same in Kusumu, so Nilotic and or Nilotic and Kushitic in these cases as well. So that's the kind of idea, and that's what's driven us to these starting points, but as I say, you know, ideally we'll get data from, from more areas and certainly as we bring more people into the team, that should be um, made easier as well. And the final thing to say is that, of course, we're aware that Swahili is spoken outside of Kenya and Tanzania, but just for practical purposes, we've chosen these two countries where we're really lucky also to have a, a team who are based at universities in, in each of these countries as well. We've got that strong link to our local research context. So at that point, I think I hand over to, to Julius to talk us through some of the, the features of variation. Yes, uh, thank you, Hannah, for that uh, nice introduction and uh, some sort of background. So here now we are going to see the um, uh, areas of variation that we are going to investigate. But we understand that uh, direct variation in Swahili has uh, long been uh, recorded by some uh, scholars and this is particularly in, in the aspects of phonology and, and morphology and recently there has been some interest in in micro variation in Swahili uh, that is variation within uh, the language and the, the different dialects uh, variation in different uh, features and the attention has been on object mapping relative causes and relative construction and, and, and other areas and we are aware of some micro variation studies that have already been conducted before uh, uh, in languages such as East Corsa and, and languages in the, in the region. Um, now we are going to uh, examine our variation in four main parameters uh, that we already have some preliminary data on. And the first one is in variation in term, in term marking, tense aspect of mark, tense uh, aspects uh, and mood marking, and particularly in the use and the non use of the ag term marker. So we found a lot of uh, variations with regard to the use of this term marker uh, uh, between standard Swahili and colloquial Swahili. So the, the, in standard Swahili, uh, the, the ag would be usually be uh, left out. So as you see in example number one, where we're Ula Wapi. Uh, while it's a colloquial Swahili counterpart, would be use the ag marker, as in Una Ulaga Wapi, where do you usually eat? And this has been widely spread even in some artistic works and some bongo flavor songs and the like. As you noted, this from one famous uh, singer, uh, Sumali, Fosala Kunyumba Gamsama Kunaga, the art is there as well. Um, yes. 
another area of variation that we want to look at, and we, we think we will find some more interesting. Uh, um, okay, so with this, the ag marker, yes, the, the ag as a habitual marker, we noted that uh, it's not a new innovation, it was there even in proper banking. So we think that this is being simply reintroduced in colloquial Swahili. Uh, so Swahili uh, will be judged as a uh, similar Swahili may be reclaiming the productive, body, uh, the productive inflection by using the ag marker, and this has already been noted by Jose Marira in 2010. Uh, uh, and it's also in connection with some certain Swahili varieties. Uh, maybe uh, uh, provisionally, we think it is associated with the amendment identity, maybe as MOOC finding relation to the outcome. Yes, can you use slide, please? Yes, another aspect of variation or parameter variation that is interesting is in evaluation, evaluating morphology. And this is a particularly to do with the, um, the diminutive, uh, which is found in classes uh, 12 and, and 13. The, we saw some variations in the use of uh, this uh, uh, class marker, and it is uh, particularly common in colloquial Swahili, as in Kilamtu Anahitaji Kashamba Kake, and even in Shen and Hako Kamono. Kana Katisianga. And so um, this is common in, in colloquial Swahili, whereas in standard Swahili, uh, one would say, come to an Italian shamba lake, or hako kamono, which is kamono, it would be mano or something like that. And yes, can we move to the next slide? Yes. And the use of uh, ka uh, as a diminutive marker has already been established uh, by some um, Masamba, Kihore, and other scholars. And they see that uh, um, um, it is a, used by some, some, some varieties or some speakers, uh, while in some varieties it, it is not used. So particularly in, in colloquial Swahili, this would be very common, but in standard Swahili, as this is not common. And you see there, uh, that table of noun class in Swahili, the diminutive ka would be in class 12, and it's uh, plural would be in, in class uh, 13, a total or two total. And there is a remark about these stars that you see in class 12 and 13. And I can move to the next slide where there is a remark about this. So the car and the two and other words that have been marked with the star there uh, indicates that uh, they are a, a result of, of, of the result of Bantu, the influence from, from Bantu, from Bantu languages. And they have not been widely accepted in the standard Swahili, um, even though some people are, are using them. So this, as, as, as you see, this is, is an influence from other uh, Bantu languages. So some people accept them, but others still see, view them as ungrammatical. Yes. Um, another interesting area of variation or dialectic variation is in locative marking. Uh, where, as we probably know that um, Swahili has three ways of expressing a location. One is through the use of kwa, and there is the use of uh, position me, and then there is a uh, bare uh, marking of nouns. Um, in coastal areas, uh, coastal Swahili varieties, the, the kwa um, uh, locative marker would be usually be used with the noun referring to human beings. As in the end of Parafiangu, Konatari, Konshana, Korama, and you name all the uh, nouns of the five to nouns, which go very well with the uh, uh, preposition marker aqua. Uh, but the other, in other situations, we can also opt for the use of the suffix me, which is attached to, or to nouns. And this is uh, acceptable or common with inanimate objects. 
it's like in Kisu, Kisu, Kiko, uh, Kisu, Kiko, Meza. Um, but the knees uh, is omitted when you uh, mention or you use, refer to uh, uh, proper nouns, uh, locative nouns that, that, that indicate proper nouns like uh, maybe Tanzania, Landa, etc. So it is uh, not okay to say Tanzanian or, or London or Kenya and, and the like. Um, but as you can see, as uh, noted by Ashton and other scholars, uh, uh, there are other nouns uh, that refer to uh, uh, referring to that refer to people, but they may appear in their uh, their bare nouns. And I think you can see this in this in next uh, slides. Um, yes, and we would like to connect our our, our observations with. Uh, a, a survey sort of or study that was uh, carried out by Redel Gibson, uh, Redel Gibson Martin and Taji uh, with some 13 participants from the University of Dar es Salaam who observed the use of these uh, uh, locative markers, particularly Kwa and other markers. Um, um, some varieties, varieties of Swahili allow Kwa to introduce a, a non human argument. We saw that uh, in, in, as I said in, in the previous slide, that uh, along the coast, the qua would normally be used with, uh, um, with, with personal nouns like kwa juma, kwa joni, kwa asha. But here we see that uh, some participants or some speakers accept the use of kwa with the non human nouns like sham, as an example, eight, kuleka majende kwa sham. And out of the 13 participants, six said, no, oh, this construction is not okay, it's not good, but seven had some mixed uh, feelings, uh, mixed responses regarding that, that the use of power with non-human nouns. Uh, but others can be used freely. We also saw that in that, uh, in that, in that short survey. Um, it's like a, one would say, quenda shule or anakwenda shule, kwa shule or shule. Some participants also accept that as a well uh, as a, a, a well formed a, a structure, but uh, you know there are some restrictions in, in with these nouns like shule, but because some of them would be totally uh, not accept uh, to be used without the the preposition or the locative marker like uh, kanisa, bomini wa mekwenda kanisa. That was judged and grammatical and acceptable by most of the participants, nine of them. Only four had some, you know, some, some frowning reactions. Some said, mm, maybe okay, but to a large extent, it's not okay. Uh, but constructions like number 10, while you went up by Juma, this would be like 100% of the participants said this is okay. So it's an indication that Kwa with the human entities uh, is a, you know, is a, so it's a widely spread uh, uh, and pattern, and it is generally be accepted by, by some by speakers. Yes, the last area that we, we, we want to look at, and we think we will find some interesting uh, 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 data, is in variation in term again. Uh, this is uh, different from the term that we looked at earlier, because that was to do with the the ag marker and the like, but this one here is particularly to do with tense marker, especially the past tense. And we see there are some variations because the standard one is to use the li that which is how most speakers of Swahili would say, like in Tanzania, nearly fine. The li marker must uh, the li uh, marks uh, marks uh, or indicates a uh, past tense. But there are other varieties that um, do sort of a vowel alternation or vowel change. We just change the final vowel um, to indicate past. And this is common in varieties like Kichani, Kijambiani, Kitumbatu, Roman, and Kibeni, uh, Kinungui, where they just say Nitende, uh, that means uh, maybe I did. So the final vowel uh, changes from R to A. And in other varieties like Kijambiani and Kipaje, we do also use the same, but uh, the knee would simply be reality as it mm, without the A, ah, but it's the same, uh, the same approach, the same strategies change in the final. 
So we think that uh, these areas, uh, in, in, in these four areas and probably others, uh, we will find some more interesting data that will, 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 will be of interest um, and will be um, to, to people who are interested to, uh, to know more of Swahili. Uh, let me hand it back to Anna so that she can proceed with the last section. Thank you, Julius. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to highlight a few of our, our kind of methodological uh, considerations and perhaps um, challenges that we're already thinking about in these early stages. So um, I, I hinted at this at the beginning, but we've already seen that variation and varieties are perceived in different ways. So when we talk about dialects, people often uh, seem to think that we're talking about the kind of uh, coastal Swahili dialects. So these are like the ones that I named earlier on, Kiamu, Kimbita, uh, Kyunguja, um, uh, and, and so on. And then notions such as mainland Swahili or colloquial mainland Swahili are often then not seen as dialects in the same way, uh, regardless of whether you're using the word dialect or, or lahaja. Um, you know, people have quite strong uh, views, it seems, about what dialects are, and it would be fantastic to hear from the audience uh, here today if people have thoughts or ideas about how to kind of, uh, deal with this or, or suggestions. Um, so the kind of idea that there are dialects which are associated with uh, Uswahilini, kind of Swahili coast, and then other varieties are more peripheral, including, for example, um, varieties spoken in Democratic Republic of Congo. So that's already an issue when we start talking about variation and varieties and something we're trying to work out what to do with. When we talk about uh, variation, we have so far focused on locations. We've chosen these six areas to start with, for perhaps data collection. We haven't said we're going to study 20 named dialects or three named dialects. Um, so this is something that we're, we're still thinking about, but that has been our approach so far. Then there is the um, issue perhaps of, of standard Swahili. Uh, so again, historically at least based on a dialect of Zanzibari or Kinguja dialect um, of, of Swahili. So there is this notion of standard Swahili, although quite what that is is in itself interesting. So to what extent will this interact with or um, challenge some of the data that we're able to get when we talk to people, when we ask people questions, um, thinking a little bit about um, the role of standard Swahili in this, we also don't want to essentially conduct a comparison. So we're not trying to say, you know, Julia's presented some very nice examples here of Aga. What we don't want to do is say in standard Swahili, it's like this. And in you know, variety X, it's like this. We're not trying to just compare standard Swahili and, and variation, but we're conscious of the presence of, you know, of this sort of standardized um, form. Um, also, areas which I tentatively said perhaps we had, at least traditionally, uh, first language speakers or, or monolingual speakers of Swahili on the coast, again, the Swahili coast. We're also aware of the presence there of perhaps multiple dialects. So even if people do think of themselves as knowing and, and speaking standard Swahili, then having other Swahilis that they have access to as well. So people being multi or bi-dialectal at least, and to what extent we want to tease that apart or engage with that, will that cause challenges um, or how to capture it? Because of course that's interesting um, as well. Many of the other contexts are highly multilingual. So we have these larger varied language ecologies and the presence of, of different languages, um, which is one of the things that we're interested in this project and one of the goals, but we are conscious of the role of these other languages and these ecologies in our attempts to um, better understand the variation that we find in Swahili. So that's something else to kind of keep in mind. Also from a purely practical perspective, um, if we're conducting uh, research in Swahili, for example, what role does that have um, on, our, on our data that we do collect? Or if we're using English or other languages, you know, what influence will that have in these multilingual contexts? We're also interested in um, youth language practices primarily Swahili-based youth languages, um, so Sheng in, in Kenya, perhaps more widely, although Nairobi is probably one of the areas that um, we're interested in. Um, and so how do we tease apart the role of 
for example, a youth language or an urban youth language, um, and how does that link to factors? So identity is one of the things we want to look at. How are they, how are they linked? How are they distinct? We've also had people ask us whether we think Sheng is a variety of Swahili, which is you know, an interesting question in and of itself. And then, of course, in Tanzania, we have youth language practices as well that we're interested in. So one of the things that we're conscious of is that our starting point for a project like this on variation, and particularly morphosyntactic variation, is quite different from dialectal variation projects that are working on better described languages or varieties. So the Scott Syntax Atlas or the Atlas of Italian Dialects, um, Dutch, you know, their starting point was quite different in terms of descriptive knowledge and understanding. They were perhaps already able to say, these are the areas that we see variation in either geographically or um, you know, relation to age or relation to gender or relation to socioeconomic class. Um, and we have some ideas and we have a growing list of anecdotes and really helpful input from people. But what we're not quite able to say is this is a feature of variation that we know is different in the East and the West or the North and the South. Because we're not even sort of at that stage um, with Swahili in, in many cases. So we're also conscious that we're starting from a different uh, starting point. And our final thing that we've been thinking about from that outset really um, is just trying to be conscious of centering Swahili. So it remains to be seen whether the kind of methodologies and the sociolinguistic categories that have traditionally been used to model languages of what we might call the global north hold for the context of research on Swahili. Can they accurately capture the variation found? So the features of variation that we presented earlier on we're, we're not questioning those, but some of the work, for example, in variationist sociolinguistics, which is very much based on these characteristics that I talked about, an age, gender, socioeconomic class, education, employment, things like that. We expect that they may be different in the, not even just in the African context, not even just the Swahili context, but across much of the world that has not yet been examined for these kind of features and this kind of um, detail. And so we're conscious not to take those you know, kind of pre-assumed um, uh, kind of conclusions from other places and then just translate them and apply them to East Africa. Um, the, the flip side of that is that we're also interested in how the study of this major African lingua franca can broaden scholarship on language variation within global languages. Again, um, work that's often dominated by languages of the global north. So how can Swahili and our better understanding of variation in Swahili help us better understand variation, linguistic variation in, in other languages as well, not just kind of one direction. Um, and we're also inspired by some of the work there um, in sort of global Englishes or lingua franca English and thinking about Englishes around the world and, and global English and, and keeping those notions uh, in mind. And again, um, thinking about using appropriate contexts and, and notions and centering Swahili, uh, sort of inspired um, by the work of Makalela and, and um, Makoni as well, who note the importance of applying sociolinguistic notions from the African context. So for example, translanguaging, so drawing on multiple linguistic repertoires and resources, perhaps not always seeing them as discrete codes. You know, I'm speaking language X and now I've moved to speak language Y. Also thinking of multilingualism itself as central to identity formation, not monolingual or multiple monolingualisms, but multilingualism itself. Um, Makalela asked us to think about multilingual multilingualism as well as uh, monolingual multilingualism. And then Makoni um, uh, from multilingualism to spontaneous order. So again, um, these are, are not you know, necessarily from the kind of Swahili context, but thinking about some of the, the work and the discussion, the discourse that is going on in Africa um, uh, on some of these, these topics uh, and issues. So just have a little um, summary um, and then uh, we're looking forward to your, your questions and any comments. So uh, the project investigates uh, morphosyntactic dialectal variation in Swahili um, and it's linked to language contact and its role in constructing speakers identity. Um, so it builds on the variation which has been historically tested and described um, and expands the focus to ideally uncover more synchronic distribution, uh, dis, uh, 
So a more synchronic distribution of present day variation. So we do know some of the things that happened in the past, the who versus algo is a nice example, but what's happening uh, today. Um, we think we're going beyond more traditionally established dialects. Um, so we're interested in including varieties and usage, which has received less attention. Um, and hoping to therefore better understand the linguistic dynamics um, of the language. Variation here is considered with regard to multilingualism, which is linked to language contact, um, and also the central role of language for identity, um, and in these broader language ecologies. So again, not just thinking about languages as discrete codes. Um, and we're also hoping through the project to broaden our understanding of variation within major languages um, and contributing to that discourse, which so far has very much um, focused on languages of the global north. So we're still in the process of working out exactly which features to kind of focus on or start on perhaps beyond what we currently know. Um, we talked a little bit about using a perceptual dialectology study um, and Julius already presented some findings of a study that we that well, he, he conducted, um, but we, we did looking at the variation with the locatives. So, you know, some more kind of pilot work and, and initial steps. Um, we're also thinking about how best to build up what we're thinking of as appropriate research infrastructure. So I mentioned appointing a couple of research assistants in both um, Tanzania and Kenya, but also how best to identify a broad range of speakers and participants, people who want to be involved. And of course, all of this balancing the competing priorities of an international collaborative team, our institutions have different requirements and demands on us, um, and we have different priorities and interests, so it's always exciting to be working together and bringing those things uh, together. And if um, everything goes smoothly, we will be meeting in person for the first time next week, in fact, uh, in Nairobi for, uh, for our first in-person project meeting, so that's very exciting. And we're hoping to kind of start data collection in earnest slightly later on this year, but no doubt lots of other uh, next steps um, as well. So I think that's it for now. Asanteni, thank you all for listening. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's a really fascinating project that you are starting. Um, so we can start the discussion right away. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand and I will send the request to unmute. Uh, please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that they will be part of uh, the recording and be released on YouTube. You can also write your question or comment in the chat and I will read it out. Um, let me see, I think there's already something in the chat. Supplied by Amani Lusukelo. He says, a very nice research project. He is personally looking forward to seeing an inventory of locative nouns, which behave like um, Schule school that takes locative knee optionally. He quickly tested uh, Mezzani, Siconi, Mutoni, uh, Bafuni, all take mandatory knee. Thank um, <laughs> I think it's a very helpful uh, comment. Thank you, Amani. It's nice to nice to yeah know you're here and to have your input. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's another bit as well. Uh, Yes, so I think this is exactly it. Can we, we would like to keep going and seeing which nouns take this um, obligatorily, optionally, where it's prohibited and to better understand um, this uh, and in colloquial Swahili. So I think there's a few things going on. One is the nouns, and then one is the variation between speakers who accept perhaps one of these three um, uh, strategies um, or choose choose them and then for us from the contact perspective also interesting to know if people speak other languages to what extent and then if these other languages then influence what's permissible for them in in Swahili. Um, Julius I don't know if you have any other like comments or thoughts you want to make because you of course did you know actually sort of conducted the survey and saw how people responded and things. Yeah, sure. Uh, Amani's comments are very interesting. And yes, there is a, a lot of, uh, um, a, of it's, it's, it's still not, not clear uh, so far uh, regarding the use of me with some, some nouns, uh, because some would take both me and they would accept their marking, uh, so like Sule 
or shuleni, but others would uh, you know, just accept one form. So we need to explore this further in the, in the project, and we hope that we will get some interesting findings. Thank you. I also see that Agustino Kakwema has responded in the chat um, to Amani, who says that uh, we also have nouns like um, hospitali, standi, which take me optionally. Standi doesn't take me. Um, I don't see any raised hands at the moment, but uh, I see that Alice Mitchell has posted in the chat. She says, thank you very much, Hannah and Julius. Uh, all very exciting. Uh, she has a comment and a question. Uh, the comment first, she thinks that you're absolutely right to think carefully about how well Western social linguistic concepts translate to East Africa. And she thinks identity is one candidate there to be careful with. And her question is, are you planning to use any crowdsourcing or citizen science approaches in your data collection? She could imagine this being quite successful. Yeah, sure. Um, Thanks, Alice. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I think I'm glad you, I'm glad you uh, think that uh, we're right to be cautious. Um, so we're, we're being cautious. Um, in terms of the citizen science, it's really interesting. So we have a few ideas, but if you have suggestions or anyone else here has suggestions, please do share them. So I think my sort of understanding of citizen science is perhaps like not that we ask one person, you know, sit down with them for an hour or so, but we try and get as much data from you know lots and lots of people um, through creative methods um, and we had a before this project we had quite an ambitious idea to design an app so there's such a thing for you know British English for example where it gets you to answer maybe 20 questions and then it tells you where it, it thinks you are from right so there's so much known about variation in, in English or British English but even English more broadly I could then answer my questions and even put in a recording and it tells me, oh, you're from this place or that place. Um, so we weren't quite thinking that we we're able to do that with Swahili yet, but we were thinking about doing the other way around. So like with the ni and the kwa, you know, meza, mezani, we could very easily come up with a number of questions, which we then get people to fill in, you know, so on, on a phone or kind of make it a game or something like that. Um, so perhaps it doesn't need to be as technological as an app but you know we could do a survey that could very easily be shared via whatsapp or or phones and things like that so that was a one um idea that we already sort of had if you have other suggestions that would be great and then the other thing is pre-existing resources so mozilla um have a um I'll, I'll find the link and post it in the chat afterwards but a um crowdsourced um, bank of actually lots and lots of languages. Their Kinyarwanda seems to be absolutely massive, but they have Swahili data set um, as well. So that would be not us collecting it, but using something that has already been collected. It's open source um, and seeing for our purposes, if there's variation there, um, uh, I think the easier thing to do with that is perhaps pronunciation. They get lots and lots of people to read out sentences and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, those were the kind of two things that that came to mind. But yeah, if people have suggestions or know people who are doing other citizen science type um, projects, um, then yeah, please do let us know. Oh yes, co Common Voice, that's it. I'll try and find the link and share it with everyone as well. Maybe Julius wants to respond to the next question when we get to that, uh, from another question from Amani, I don't know. If Anna, you want to read yeah, it? Out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me just read it out. So it's also in the in the recording. Uh, so Amani Lusikelu says he is told that standard uh, Kiswahili is not spoken, um, but rather a written language. So even if you wanted it, how could it be possible to gather spoken data in spoken standard Kiswahili? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't think it, 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 it's, it's right to say yes. Uh, uh, is written. What we can say is that it is it's mainly written, but there are people speaking standard Swahili, and the same applies to non-standard. You know, there are people who speak non-standard, and there are people who even write non-standard Swahili. So I think we can get enough enough data from both uh, spoken and, and written sources. That's uh, my view. Maybe Hannah uh, has something to, to add from there. Yeah. It, thank. Thank you. Um, 
for the question and, and for your comment, Julius, as well. I, it's not something that I had thought about before, I have to admit. So I think, yeah, we have a sort of idea of standard Swahili and perhaps we go to reference grammars and, and books and things like that. But I don't think I, in my head, it is not spoken. I think there are some examples of spoken standard Swahili, but I, it's, not a, it's not something I thought about. So that's really helpful. Maybe we can think a little bit about what we what we think standard Swahili is and where we might find it if it exists. And, and I think, as I tried to say, we're perhaps not interested in standard Swahili anyway. So it's a helpful reference point, but we perhaps don't want to gather, if, even if that was possible, lots of standard Swahili. We're perhaps interested in all the other variation. Um, but yeah, really helpful question. And I see that Andrew Harvey has raised his hand, so I think I'll go there. Thanks, uh, Hannah and Julius, for uh, this really sort of exciting uh, exposition on, on the start of um, what I think will be a really valuable and, and in some ways groundbreaking uh, project. So congratulations on, uh, on getting that funding. I know, I know it can be difficult, and I'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of it. And sort of attached to this, and you'll excuse me for being parochial here, but sort of in the context of the of, of our network of the Rift Valley network of people who are working in an area that's sort of primarily up country or mainland in context where Swahili sort of overlays this long history of both Bantu and non-Bantu languages in contact and where people's experiences with or even sort of social depth with exposure to Swahili are very different. What do you think, are there things that you can sort of foresee or, or linkages that you can expect with, you know, with your project, either sort of in terms of its, of its subject matter or its methodology, uh, you know, do you, do you see linkages between what you're doing or what you're going to find out and, and kind of the work that, that, that. Maybe I should ask, <laughs> maybe I should ask you. That, that well, and, and this is, and this is sort of not, not necessarily, sorry, I, I, I didn't direct it properly. It's, it's actually sort of not, not just for you guys, but actually for the rest of our audience here as well. Maybe this is mm -hmm. something that we want to think of and we don't need to answer it right away. I mean, that's just sort of mm -hmm. something to think about. I mean, one thing we could say straight away is although, yeah, we didn't have an arrow, you know, saying Rift Valley area Swahili, of course, we're interested <laughs> in, in Swahili as it is spoken anywhere. Um, so if mm. people have, you know, examples or, or data, but I, even just, you know, when we say data, so one of the things that I was most, as someone who studied Swahili and Amani, you know, I probably learned Kiswahili Sanifu because I was taught it, you know, from a book at university, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. When I started working in the Rift Valley area, the thing that struck me was this Quenye. So I had not learned it and I hadn't come across it. And people would say, Niko Quenye, all sorts of things. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is my own sort of anecdote, but ultimately this is why I'm now doing a project on variation in Swahili. I studied Swahili in Lamu, I studied Swahili in Zanzibar, and then I went and spent time in you know, Kondoa districts and found it different. So those of you who are here who are working in different parts of you know, East Africa or the world, I mean, please do send us an email <laughs> saying, I heard this example, what do you think? I mean, that would be a great, a great um, thing for, for us. Um, just, you know, inspiration and ideas um, is really valuable. Um, but yes, if there are other suggestions about how we can uh, collaborate or how we can contribute, then please, you know, let us know. Then I see that there's comments uh, in the chat. So I'll start with um, the comment from Michael Karani. He says that he's sure people who say kwa shamba would also say na enda kwa soko and na enda kwa kanisa. For example, if you ask speakers in Nairobi, and then he asks, um, how are these geographical variations that seem to be many and inconsistent going to be handled given the fact that language contact, so effects of the speaker's first language may be the main cause? So is the question like one person does one thing one place, but then they can be in Nairobi and do something different? It's, it's variation even within speakers, perhaps, if I've understood correctly. 
I mean, yeah, we, we have our hands, <laughs> we have our hands full. Um, I think this is why we're aiming to use multiple different methods. So it's helpful to know someone can say naende kwa soko and they can say naende kwa kanisa. But then we also really want to know who is that person? Where are they from? What languages do they speak? How long have they lived there? You know, all these other, um, other factors. And that's why we've got this broader idea of like cross triangulating it with, you know, more kind of um, surveys, interviews, in-depth things. So some of those will be the same people, not everyone, because we can't do in-depth interviews with everyone who does the questionnaire, for example, but some of them will be the same, the same person. Um, I was just going to ask if Julius wanted to add something, but I think we might have lost Julius. Yeah, he's no longer connected. He just fell off. So I think maybe his connection. Uh, so hopefully he's going to just connect again uh, soon. Um, in the Great. Um, yeah, so I think if uh, Michael uh, has any follow up questions, I'm sure he's going to let us know in the chat. So um, I see then that after that, Amani Lusikelo uh, has a question about periphery Swahili dialects. Um, and he asked, have you thought of uh, Kigoma? Perhaps you would also have included data from Congo Swahili. I think Kigoma would be a great idea. Um, you know, as I, I think we, we are open to uh, more additions. We have a kind of starting point. Um, I don't know, Julius, we, we could do some data collection in Kigoma as well. Um, and, and yes, it would be great to include, um, you know, well, yes, we could do some data collection in Tanzania for <laughs> speakers who are from, you know, DRC, but yes, I think it's just, we're just limiting the project just for practical reasons, really, um, nothing else, but yeah, the more, the more, the better, really. And um. Then I see that there is a comment from Elizabeth Kerr. She says, thanks for the talk. She was curious about um, diglossia or um, bidialectalism. Uh, for example, someone learning um, Kunja at school, but speaking another dialect locally. She was wondering how you will handle this methodologically. Will you also, uh, sorry, will you only look at the local dialect in your research or will you look for examples at uh, differences and register within a single speaker? For theoretical implications, she thinks this would relate to work on multiple grammars. For example, is a standard Swahili feature present when speaking the local variety and thereby needed to model it and understand possible effects on other parts of the morpho syntax? Or are there two separate grammars with separate features? Um, yes, I think we will look at both, uh, you know, variations within uh, single speakers and variations across groups, but uh, to a large extent, because we, we are examining dialects is to do with groups of speakers, you see, uh, it's not individual speakers. So both of them will be considered, but to a large extent, I think groups of speakers. So speakers in this, you know, region or in this area uh, speak this way, whereas those in another area speak this way. It's language communities. And that one we are connecting with the language identity, as we mentioned in our introduction. Yes, Hannah, maybe. My <laughs> answer is <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, I think, yeah, I was just going to say from a theoretical perspective, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that's where we also just mentioned very briefly at the end notions of like translanguaging and, and just broader understandings of language. So, yes, from a, you know, grammar perspective, we might want to think of people as having separate grammars, but we're essentially interested in how they navigate or draw on all or both of them. So, um, yeah, and, and I will say we're not working with children. So I know this is not about school, but like, yes, if we're sort of trying to, you know, work on thinking also about who we are as researchers, you know, if I ask a question in so-called standard Swahili, then it's quite likely to have an impact on how someone responds. So thinking, you know, creatively about about that as well. But yeah, really, really helpful comment and question. Thank you. Maybe for my part, out of curiosity, do you have a like? Do you have a number of speakers that you're um, already thinking about targeting in total, um, or at least how many from a given area you would uh, want for a representative sample? 
That is an excellent question. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this on the recording, but I'm sure in the application for the project, we specified X number of people or X number of hours. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember um, what it what it was. Um, so we have for the like in-depth interviews, a much smaller group. So I think it was like 10 to 15, because we were imagining that these would be you know, sitting down for a few hours and really understanding things. Um, for the questionnaires, I think we were thinking more like, you know, 60 to 100, so like much larger. Um, and then there will be some in between with kind of elicitation and naturally occurring data. Um, so I think we were thinking it's it's four years, we're already six months in. So it's sort of like as much as possible, but within, you know, the realms of possibility, basically. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you really are serious about developing an app or something online, you're thinking about very different numbers than you would if you just do the interview. So it's uh, interesting to see how it's going to develop. Yeah, and we could, of course, do something like an app or just, you know, like the, the kind of crowdsource thing for just one element, right? So we get mm. 10 questions or 20 questions and really try and get out, that out to hundreds or thousands wouldn't actually be unreasonable whereas yeah for the interviews that's going to be us sitting down and talking to people and recording them etc cetera, etc cetera. so um but yeah thank you i see in the chat lizzie paul has um put something in she thinks she has noticed a difference in um Bea versus the doma where in Bea people use aki and in the doma she hears uh kamaana much more I've written it down. Thanks, Lizzie. <laughs> it's going on the list. Then if there's no further comments or questions, I think I'm going to wrap it up for today. I see no last minute hands. Um, yeah. So then it just rests me to say uh, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. I look forward to the future and hearing more about uh, the findings you will have. Um, Thank of course, also everyone for um, uh, participating today in the discussion. And I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. And the entries for each presentation are added to the bibliography. Um, looking ahead, the next webinar is going to be on Wednesday, the 23rd of February. It's going to be presented by Judy Taylor, and the title and abstract will be announced in the newsletter. Um, so thanks everyone again, and uh, I'd like to. Look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.